will tell you that when they study, um, there's so much information and revelation that God gives us that what we give you in the interval of 35 to 45 minutes is probably half of what we have studied and half of the information that we have gathered. Um, but because of time and attention span, we're not allowed to release it all. Um, so sometimes that's why we break things up into series uh, so that we can get it over the course of a time. But I'm, I'm just going to give you what God has given me or what I wrote down. Um, First Samuel 15 and verse 11, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Samuel, I regret that I made Saul king. He turned away from me and did not carry out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he prayed to the Lord all night. The Lord said to Samuel, I regret I made Saul king. I'm sorry I gave Saul an opportunity. I regret gifting him. I'm sorry I trusted them with the responsibility of a gift. I want to talk today from the subject, the arrogance of the gifted. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, the arrogance of the gifted. Um, I want you to take notes today. I, I sent out, I sent out a, a missive that all leaders and ministry workers were to be present today. Number one, too many of you have been out of place lately, and we have to bring an end to the subtle insubordination that is becoming blatant. In leadership and in our church. Um, I, I have given our executive pastor instruction to sit down those who are not present today um, without accountability. If you operate in the church, um, and if you will operate in the church or this church, um, and you think you don't have to submit to authority, then you need to be released from the responsibility of ministry because it's evident you can't handle it yet. I need you to understand what it means to be under apostolic leadership. When you're under apostolic leadership, we're not allowed to let things slide. Right? We're not allowed uh, to let things slide. We're not allowed to just uh, allow you to do what you want to do. Yeah, I know many of you thought that joining Mount Moriah, joining a church full of young people meant there will be an absence of standard. And it's not going to roll like that. Uh, I, I need you also today to hear with priestly ears, hear with priestly ears, because whenever there's a word of correction, there's always the mindset of a uh, pastor throwing shade, especially with your generation. There's always the mindset a pastor trying to come for me, you know, uh, but I need you to hear with priestly ears today. I need you to hear with priestly ears today because whenever God sends correction, it means he's still giving you a chance. Now, some messages are to push your life forward. Turn me down just a little bit. Some messages are to push your life forward and some are to push the kingdom forward. Today, we're going to push the kingdom forward. We're going to focus on the church today. One of the amazing responsibilities of pastoring extremely gifted people, that's one of the amazing responsibilities I have, is that is pastoring extremely gifted people. This is a phenomenally gifted church. Many gifts, many talents, much anointing, and massive opportunity. But here is what I'm sensing. I'm sensing gift outweighing character. I'm, I'm sensing gift and the affirmations of gifts outweigh pureness and servanthood. Romans 10, Romans 10, Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they be saved. Because they are zealous, but not according to knowledge. 
their zeal is contaminated because it is preceded on mistaken principles and moved in a wrong way. I, I'm seeing and I'm sensing the appearance, here's what I'm catching, the appearance of superiority in gifting. Some of you have allowed your gift to give you an undertone of arrogance, but you are smart enough to act humble. But your heart is far from it. Okay. Now, one of the things that um, is you have as a gifted pastor, a musician and a preacher and a, a creative, one of the things you have is that you really can't get over on one who's been accused of arrogance all his life. You can't get over on him the actual definition of arrogance. Um, arrogance is, for those of you taking notes, and, and you, you need to take notes. You need to take notes because you need to grow. Amen. You need to take notes because you need to grow. Uh, if you're hearing this word today and you're not taking notes, you're not taking it in, and you don't, don't go back through the week to look over your notes and look back over the sermon, then three months from now, I'm going to have to come and preach the exact same thing because it will still be evident in the house. Are y'all here? Arrogance is offensive display of superiority or self-importance. It is overbearing pride. It's more than the way you walk into a room. It's more than not speaking to people. It's deeper than turning your nose up and acting snobbish because that's what the church has limited arrogance to. But arrogance can be shown in how many of you hold ministry hostage because of your gifting. You're not in place, you're missing assignments, you're holding back ideas for your personal ministry instead of bringing them to your church for the kingdom advancement. Your conversation about church behind closed doors, didn't, it, it pronounces or exposes arrogance. Y'all ain't talking here. Mm -hmm. Your lack of serving unless the spotlight is on you. Unless there's recognition. All of this can be labeled as arrogance. We're going to get to the, the real definition of it. Not, you know, you know, we joke around here and we call each other arrogant all because we, you know, we dress nice and we look good and the way we shout, the way we dance and stuff like that. That's not arrogance. That's just a joke. Let me explain to you what arrogance really is. It is the expression and elevating of self-importance. Those of you who feel like you're bigger than the vision. <clears throat> standing here last Sunday, I was standing here, and the Lord, during praise and worship, spoke clearly uh, what to say this week. He said, too many of your people are arrogant in their gifting. He began to give me certain areas of focus today, and he gave me about six, but I'm not going to deal with all of them uh, on today. But he gave me uh, about six that will expose the arrogance of the gifted. <clears throat> Number one, you become arrogant in your gifting when you adopt convenience mentality, when you, when you adopt a convenience mentality, this ministry is in a place where it can't afford for you to be connected or pro MMCC only when you feel like it. The weight of the assignment on this church demands that we have your whole heart and not partial interests. Some of you, watch this, some of you are comfortable only working in ministry when it's convenient for you because you have the wrong perception concerning serving. Uh, your mentality is, oh, I, I, I got to go to choir rehearsal tonight. I got to go to praise and worship rehearsal. I got to go clean the church. When the truth of the matter is, your mentality should be, I get to. Lord have mercy. David Livingston says, how can commission by an earthly king be considered an honor, but commission from a heavenly king be considered a sacrifice? And there's something wrong with everything you do for the church is considered sacrifice. There has to be a mental shifting. 
you have to get out of the mentality of I got to or I have to to the place where I get to. Why? Because what we are doing is a privilege. It is a privilege that I get to play an instrument. It is a privilege. And I, and I, and I know, I know these guys are very gifted. So I can use them for an example without them getting offended like some of y'all. So for, for, for them, they serve here. This is their church. They are members here and they serve despite their pay. Are y'all with me? Because their mentality is I get to serve. All right. All right. All right. So you have to have the mentality that what I'm doing, it is a privilege. It is a privilege to work sound. It is a privilege to be on the media team. It is a privilege that I get to lead the people in intercession. It is a privilege that I get to stand before the people and lead them into the presence of the Lord on the worship team. It is a privilege that I get to pick up trash. It is a privilege that I get to clean the house of God. It is a privilege I get to. You got to change your mentality. Those of you who are connected to this church, you know that I've taught you a long time ago. We don't even believe in the word lay member. There's nobody that's connected to our church that's supposed to come into the church and you just be a pew member, as the old church would say. Everywhere you are in ministry, whatever place you have in ministry, if you aren't a person with the title, your job is the ministry of helps. Having enough loving people serving. Wherever I can put my hand to, that's where I want to work. If it means I have to sign up for outreach, I'll be here. If it means I got to sign up to clean the church, I'll be here. Whatever you need me to do, I'm here because it is my privilege. It's my privilege. Privilege to serve God. I don't want to stay on this too long. Philippians 2 and 5. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, whom being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. In other words, Jesus Christ, who is God, took on the form of a servant. When he looked at his assignment, he says, who I am don't matter. Okay, okay, because you thought that, okay, thank you, Holy Ghost, uh, you, you, you thought that because of who you are and your gifting that you're supposed to be recognized on a certain level, but the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who was God, but made, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant and became like the likeness of man and became obedient unto death which means anything that will keep you from serving with a pure heart die to it Lord have mercy he became obedient unto death even the death of the cross I need you to catch this because a lot of you are in ministry trying to bring glory to yourself but the Bible says when Jesus became obedient unto death he and God highly exalted him and gave him a name that's above every name. He didn't have to do it for himself, but God recognized his work. The pastor didn't pat him on the back. God recognized his work. The people around him didn't say, you did a good job, you killed today. God recognized his work. And God highly exalted him. Gave him a name above every name. Convenience mentality. Some of you serve out of convenience because you have not learned to prioritize your life. So you blame your lack of serving on your family. You blame your failure to be in place on your children. You blame your failure to do your part on your job when in actuality you volunteered to work during the time of worship. They didn't schedule you. You, you, you blame it on your marriage. Some of you serve out of convenience because to you, God is only in good enough for leftovers. Let's look at Malachi 1 and 10. Malachi 1 and 10 says, Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not uselessly meet in my name. 
I am not pleased with you. This is what paraphrase of verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 10. It would be better to close the doors of the church than to dishonor God when you meet. You are so apt to serve God on your own terms and time that when you do, he says it would be better that you don't even do it at all. Oh, Lord, have mercy. This is what the word says. You, you give everything else, your energy, and whatever you have left, you give it to God. That's why it's so easy for you to be out of place and throw your responsibility elsewhere. The second thing, first thing is convenience mentality makes you become arrogant in your gifting. The second thing, when correction becomes shade. Social media, immaturity, and your desire to escape truth will allow you an excuse to label correction from your leader as shade. You will begin, watch this, you will begin to walk in the spirit of offense and allow your perception of the leader to be contaminated because if you position yourself as a victim and taint the view of your leader, then you give yourself an excuse that makes you feel comfortable with leaving the church. That's why they're gone. Stop trying to serve anywhere in ministry if you cannot handle correction. Lord, have mercy. The goal of church discipline, help me God, the goal of church discipline is not to punish a failing brother or sister in Christ. On the contrary, the purpose is to bring the person to a point of godly sorrow and repentance so that he or she turns away from sin and experiences a fully restored relationship with God and other believers. Individually, the intent is healing and restoration. Lord, the purpose of this word tonight is to bring you to a place of healing and restoration. But corporately, the purpose is to build up or to edify or strengthen the entire body of Christ. Can I tell you something? If you leave here today with the spirit of offense on you, you want it to. Job, Job 5 and 17, it says, behold, how happy is the man. Who God reproves. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. We learn about the proper way to hear this week in our leadership training. And the reason a lot of correction cannot be received is because you have decided. You have decided. You have decided. You made a choice uh, not to hear in the right manner. We made a choice to substitute what we hear, uh, what we need to hear for what we want to hear. That's why some of you can't keep a job. You cannot handle authority and you cannot heed to correction. Your mentality is who they think they're talking to. <laughs> I don't have to do this and I don't have to do that. And now all of a sudden you're supposed to be an entrepreneur. Oh, I just exposed something. Y'all ain't got to say nothing. No, 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 no. You need to get somewhere and sit down and listen. If you don't have the discipline to follow leadership because you think you are so gifted and above others, then you don't have the character or the wherewithal to lead your own business. All right, I, I don't want to stay too long on, on none of this, but uh, a couple of things that those who receive correction must be aware of, and that is prideful deflections, all right? All right. All right. Uh, when, when Moses and Jethro were having a conversation, Jethro was talking to Moses, telling him about his leadership skills. He was telling him where he was wrong. Note Moses' remarkable response, his humble response. The Bible says in Exodus 18 to 24, so Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. Yes, yes. Mm, Lord, have mercy. See, our problem is we sit through correction. Oh, yeah, I'm going there. We sit through correction so that we can say we were corrected by our leader, but we don't do what he says. 
we're, we're training. We're training a person to go forth in ministry. We're training a person to go forth in ministry. One of the things that we do here is that when you say you've been called by God, we don't just throw you up and give you a microphone. We take you through training. And they're going through training right now. And so the first week they did what they did before us, and we corrected them. We critiqued them right on the spot. We gave them pointers. And the next time they came back, they followed everything that we said. Then I gave them a date. Because for you, promotion cannot come until you learn how to follow direction. Not just hear direction, but follow. You have to follow direction. You have to follow direction. I, I'm not going to give you all of this. Let's go to the third thing. The third thing, the first thing, first of all, is we have to get rid of the convenience mentality. The second thing is we cannot allow correction to become shade. The third thing is... You become arrogant in your giftedness when accountability is labeled as control and manipulation. When accountability is labeled as control and manipulation. The way, the way many of us rationalize not being held accountable for our actions both in ministry and in life is we try to accuse those who hold us accountable of control or manipulation. We try to make it seem as if a, a, a negative is being done to us so that we can have the relief or the freedom from the pressure of being in place. Accountability is the willingness to accept responsibility for one's actions. Accountability, let me say this again, is the willingness to accept responsibility for one's action. Watch this. By definition, it says capable Lord have mercy, of being explained, let me add this, without lying. It means when I'm out of place, I have a reasonable, integral explanation, watch this, as to why I chose the time that I'm to be in service, the time I'm to be in rehearsal, the time I'm to be in that meeting to do this other endeavor. Hmm. See, what you got to understand is whenever you are absent, whenever you are out of place, you create lack in the kingdom of God. Now, I don't need you to run off in offense. I'm not talking about those of you who have to go to school. I'm not talking about those of you who have to work. I'm not talking about those of you who have to do things with your children at that point in time. I'm talking to those of you who try to find a way to escape responsibility. Trying to find a way to escape accountability. That's why our church is not growing. That's why we see the same people every week. Because you can't be accountable and be in place. Uh, Lord have mercy. You, they know I love them. But I'm tired of walking out of my office and coming to here uh, to a different praise team every single week. I need you accountable. I need you accountable. Walk off with offense if you want to. I need you accountable and in place. How in the world can you go anywhere else if you can't serve at home the time you're supposed to be at home? Let me back up. You become arrogant in your gifting when you look at correction as shade. Nobody's trying to be shady tonight. I'm trying to bring you the word of God to help you. I want to increase you. So, watch this. Accountability is the willingness to accept responsibility for one's actions. Capable of being explained. It means when I'm out of place, I have a reasonable, integral explanation as to why I chose service time, meeting time rehearsal time to do what I wanted to do why because once you put yourself watch this once you put yourself in a committed relationship once you pledge once you come down to the altar once you go online and join the church you make a commitment and a dedication to that entity especially if you're in leadership you make a commitment to be in place let me talk from experience 
I've always found an excuse not to be in place when my heart wasn't attached to the place I'm supposed to be. When I didn't want to be there, I would find a reason not to go. When I was working, when I was working in the school system, I could easily wake up and conjure up a reason why I cannot go to work. Why? Because I didn't want to go no way. Some of you don't have the testimony of sacrifice. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I said some of you don't have the testimony of sacrifice. There are times where you have to sacrifice even when it's a privilege because so much happens and so much takes place in our life. And there has to be times where God sees that by any means necessary, I will be there. By any means necessary, I will shut down everything that I have to do and I will be in place. I will complete my assignment. I will pay my money. I will give up my time. Time, I will be there. Watch this. No one in the church should be above accountability. In fact, the more prominent one's leadership role, the more important accountability becomes for the sake of the leader and that of the whole church. It is essential that leaders and members have accountability relationships. Lord, have mercy. We have to have accountability relationships in which they are regularly held to account in the areas of time usage, ministry activities, preaching, theology, personal spirituality, uh, ethics, and morality. See, some of our ministries are failing in the church because you all don't hold each other accountable. Some of y'all are waiting for me to say what I'm saying today when you should have preached it in the meeting. Lord, have mercy. If you are absent or out of place, somebody needs to address your failure. Stop waiting for the leader of the ministry because you're scared. And some of y'all are not scared. You just can't correct your friends. It's hard to correct people that you were just on the phone with before you got here on your way to rehearsal and they out of place. You know, I'm a musician, so I always use music as an example, so don't think I'm, I'm being funny. But if I'm a tenor, and, and I know that there are two or three of us, your absent makes me have to work harder as a teammate. So yes, I have a problem with you being as gifted as you are and not here. No way I'm going to let you slide. Accountability is all over the word of God. Proverbs 27 and 17 says, iron sharpens iron. So one person sharpens another, which means we have a responsibility for each other's growth. You ought to be reaching out to your brothers and sisters that are not in place, that are not in church. Don't tell me y'all all all scared of COVID. Please don't play that. And I mean everywhere else. James 5 and 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Uh, You have to have people in your life who you can tell your problems to and they hold you accountable. You got to have somebody in your life that you can say, I'm struggling with this and I need you to pray for me. I'm struggling with this and I need you to talk me through this. I'm on my way to do some sin. You better talk me out of it so I can go back home. You need somebody in your life who will hold you accountable. It's not just going to help you in church. It's going to help you in your life. First Thessalonians 5 and 11 says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. The Bible says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. There's a problem because you're not able to help your brother or sister because you have no word in you. This is the only time you hear the word of God. Wednesday, you don't even tune in to the virtual broadcast, so you don't hear the word of God then. So Sunday is the only time you hear the word of God, and you're trying to figure out why you ain't really got no friends. It's because you don't have anything on the inside to impart into somebody else. You got to have some word on the inside of you. I can't hold you accountable of something I don't know. Lord, have mercy. The, the, the preachers, the preachers of this house, they know about accountability. Those who minister, they don't take a, appointments without their leader knowing. 
Why? Uh, it's not control. It's not manipulation. It's accountability. You see an opportunity. I see an assignment that is beyond your ability to handle. So I'm going to tell you, no, stay home. I shouldn't see you on the flyer and say how. I shouldn't see you with a mic in someone else's pulpit that I know, uh, but, but I, I don't see you at home. Watch this. When I was coming up, it wasn't manipulation. It wasn't control. When I was coming up, uh, in, and when I was coming up in ministry, we didn't take appointments when our church had service. We didn't travel. We didn't do no training. We didn't do anything. When my pastor had to go, I was with him. Oh, Y'all ain't talking here. I don't care if it was just rehearsal. I got to be at rehearsal. Do you have another date? I didn't ask to be excused from the responsibility to go preach. Y'all don't like this. Because if I cannot be accountable at home, I'm not fit to go anywhere else. No one in the church is above accountability. Watch this. The fourth thing, and I'm going to deal with the text, and then we're going to close. The fourth thing, you become arrogant in your giftedness when you accept the curse of affirmation. Preachers and musicians have to deal with this the most. When you accept the curse of affirmation. Affirmation is when people come to affirm and give you positive review on anything that you do. People come to build you up. I, I remember last year when I went on vacation, Lady Ashley preached the entire month. When I came back, this, the Spirit of God told me to lay hands on her. And I laid hands on her, and I, I said to her, please do not be blinded. It, it, Lord, have mercy. I said, please don't be blinded by the applause that the people give you. Hmm. Because they will applaud you right into a sinful lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I said that not because I was jealous of her oil. Not because I was jealous of her anointing, but because I had been where she was. Right? And so I spoke that because I understood what the applause of people can do to the mind of a preacher. Affirmation is necessary but can be a curse to the gifted because you allow, uh, you allow affirmation to lift you up. That's why some of you, you're not surviving right now in, in any ministry in the church because as an apostolic leader, there's always a but to my affirmation. Uh, it, it's like Jesus over in Revelation. He says, you know, I seen the work that you do. I saw that you were, you persevered. I saw that you held on. I saw that you called people out who were doing wrong, but I got a problem with you. See, you don't need to be under leadership who does not have a butt at the end of your affirmation. Because my job is not to patty cake you. My job is not to just make you feel good about what you can do. My job is to point out what you're failing at. Oh, yes. My assignment is not to dwell on your positives, but to challenge your negatives. Number one, catch this. Too much affirmation can cause you to lean on affirmation solely. So you can't function without an audience, without an applause, without some type of approval. Second thing is this. Affirmation becomes your reward. Too much affirmation will push you to a place where affirmation becomes your reward. Affirmation will have you stuck in sin. Lord, have mercy. It will have you stuck in sin, and because you can still operate in gift, and people are still clapping, Lord, have mercy, you will still be operating and functioning contaminated. Let me, let, let, me, let me try to break this down to you. Let me say it again. Affirmation will have you stuck in sin because you can still operate in your gift and people still clap even when you're functioning in contamination. Because whenever affirmation becomes too much for you, it becomes solely what you hear. 
Which means that although you stand up here and your gift still works, Lord have mercy, everything you do in the kingdom, it, it, it still works. When I sit down, even after sin, it still works. That's a dangerous place to be in. Oh, yes, sir. When I grab the mic, people still running into each other. It still works. There's a problem. There's a problem because you're functioning contaminated because of all that sin on your life. All that sin in your members, all that sin that's on you, you can't hear God saying, I'm not pleased because you have elevated the sound of the claps of people ahead of God's voice. Moving to the text, 1 Samuel said I won't be long. 1 Samuel 15. I need you to understand what's happening in this text and go back and read it in your spare time. In 1 Samuel, Samuel has said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over the people. The Lord sent me to give you a gift. I need you to catch this in the spirit. The Lord sent me to anoint you over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, heed to the words of the Lord. Can I tell you something? Whenever God gives you a gift, he always gives you an assignment. Whenever he gives you a gift, there's always coming responsibility. So Samuel says to Saul that God has said, I want to punish Amalek for what they did to Israel. What they did to God's people after they came out of Egypt. I want to punish them. I want to punish them. And I want to ambush them. I want to ambush them. He says, now go and attack Amalek and destroy them. Don't let nobody live. This is how God, this is how mad God is. He says, because they mess with my people, I want you to destroy them. Do not let them live. Kill all the women, kill all the children, kill all the oxen, kill all the sheep, the camel, the donkey, kill everybody. Don't let nobody live. So Saul, with his gifted self, his anointed self, the Bible says, verse 4, gather the people together, number them, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay wait in the valley. He's getting ready to do the assignment that God says. Verse 6, then Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, get down from among the Amaleks, lest I destroy you with them. I need you to catch what's going on here. Because, uh, let me bring it into modern day times. Saul gets down there to where he's about to ambush Amalek. He's about to take them out. And he sends a text message. And says to the Kenites, he says, I need you to get out of there because I'm about to come through there and mess everything up. Right now, I need you to understand this. This is the first point we get from this text. You got to be careful of plugging in your own agenda into your God assignment. That's arrogance. Let me back up. When you plug in your own agenda to God's assignment, you move in a place of arrogance. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says that Saul told the Kenites, go ahead and get out of there because I'm getting ready to come through there. So they departed. Verse 7, and Saul attacked the Amalekites. All right? Verse 8, he also took Agag, king of the Malachites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Now I need you to understand what happens here because there's a problem. I have a problem. God has a problem with people who only hold accountable those who you want to hold accountable. God said, when you go down there, kill everybody. Saul made up his own mind, you don't deserve correction. You don't need correction, so I'm going to give you the heads up so you can depart. I'm going to save you from the correction because you're my friend. Verse 8, that's what verse 8 says. Let's move on down to verse 9. Verse 9 says, but Saul and the people spared Agag. And the best of the sheep, catch this, please don't miss this. The best of the sheep, the best of the oxen, the best of the fatlings, the best of the lambs, and all that was good. 
and were unwilling to destroy them. Verse 9 tells us that Saul, I need you to understand what the animals represent. They represent the plunder that they stole from the Amalekites. The good stuff. Here's the thing you got to understand. Paul or Saul gained selfishly from his personal, for his personal satisfaction while doing the assignment of God. It is a dangerous thing to try to share glory with God. Are y'all getting this? Are y'all eating this? He gained selfishly. He went and got all them animals for himself. God said destroy everything. He went and got all the good stuff and kept it to himself. Ah, You got to be careful that when you're on assignment, you don't try to reward yourself. Lord have mercy. Let's move on down because now the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Samuel. Word of the Lord came to Samuel. This is verse 10 saying, I, 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 verse 11 says, I am upset. I, I greatly regret. This is God talking. I greatly regret that I gifted Saul. I'm sorry that I gave him an opportunity. Can I tell you something, gifted people? You have to be careful how you handle the gift that God has given you. You have to be careful lest you make him regret giving you a gift. You can sing. That's wonderful. You better watch how you handle that. Because you will make God regret giving you a gift. Lord have mercy. Verse 12. Verse 12. This is a good Bible study. So, so when Samuel rose early in the morning, Samuel's upset. Samuel's touched by what God has said. Lord, have mercy. Uh, you need to be connected to a voice in your life that will be touched by what God says. Lord, have mercy. Can I tell you something? It means something that you're sitting in this place today and this is the word that God has given me because it means that you have a leader that has his ear pressed to the mouth of God to hear what God is saying to us in this season. I did not just come to just shout you. I could just shout you because I'm going on vacation next month, but I came to correct you because God loves you. The Bible says Samuel got upset. Got upset, got up the next morning. I need you to see what happened. He got up the next morning to go find Saul. Watch what happens. When he goes to get Saul, Saul is not in place. No accountability. Saul is not in place. He's not in place. And the Bible says when he gets down there, let's look at verse 12. So Samuel arose, he went to find Saul. Uh, and it was told to Samuel saying, Saul went to Carmel to set up a monument for himself. Lord have mercy. He went somewhere to celebrate. How arrogant are you to celebrate disobedience? Lord have mercy. Now, now, that word is for those of you who don't do as instructed, but cry when you're not celebrated. Verse 12 says, he went to find him, and this boy done gone down there and started having a party out of his disobedience. Watch this. Having a party with the stuff he rewarded himself in. Verse 13 then Samuel said to Saul, went to Saul and said to him, blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. This is what Saul says to Samuel. I performed the commandment of the Lord. How long can you lie about your commitment? To yourself and to God. I'm coming to a close. Don't worry. How long can you lie about your commitment? Samuel says, if you did what God told you to do, Watch what he says. He says, what's all this bleeding of sheep I hear? What's all this mooing of cows I hear? You ain't supposed to have none of that stuff. It's supposed to be dead. And you got to be careful when you're serving God and God can still hear the stuff that you rewarded yourself with when you were supposed to kill it. 
He can still hear the sex that's in your life. He can still smell the weed on your breath. He can still see, Lord, have mercy. Y'all ain't talking to me here. He told you to kill it. But when he came to you, you said, I did what you said. But the stench is still there. Samuel said, what you talking about? Or well, Saul says, what you talking about? I, I, I did what was told. I, I brought them to the Amalekites uh, for the people, uh, spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. I, I, I didn't even do this. The people did this. See, you got to watch out for affirmation because it will have you in a place of disobedience. Lord have mercy. Verse 17. I'm going to jump down here. So Samuel said, I need you to remember something, Saul. When you were, this is the Bible, when you were little, in your own eyes, were you the head of the tribes of Israel? <laughs> in other words, there was a place where you want nobody. I know you kill it now, but I need you to remember when you were scared to walk in your gifting, I need you to remember when they wouldn't let you play an instrument. I need you to remember when they wouldn't let you sing. I need you to remember when they didn't let you because you were not qualified. Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king of Israel? In other words, I know that you went to voice lessons and I know that you did all of this and I know that you consecrated. But God brought you to where you are. That should have been a shouting point right there. I don't care where you are in ministry. I don't care how good I stand to proclaim the word of God. I will not be where I am if God did not. Bring me to where I am. Lord, have mercy. There should never be a place or a Sunday where you come in here without a praise, without adoration. Why? Because I would not be where I am if God did not bring me to where I am. I remember seeing a meme, and y'all just share everything. I remember seeing a meme that says, y'all be giving credit to God when you work hard to get where you are. Can I ask you a question? Who gave you the limbs to work hard? Who gave you the eyes to see how you're working? Who gave you the hands to do the work? Who gave you the mind to function to do the work? It's through him that I live. It's through him that I move. It's through him that I have my bed. I need you to shake somebody's hand in the air and say, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God. That's why I give him all the glory. That's why I give him all the praise. That's why I let him get all the glory. After I do everything he called me to do, it's still to God be the glory. Have mercy. I, I grew up, I grew up with the, one of my brothers named Preverius Newton. He's a great musician, a great drummer. But growing up, Preverius would kill during the service. And I mean, he would put it down. I don't care what church we went to, he would lay it down. And when he got off the drums, I would say, man, you killed. And we would always pick on him. We started doing it on purpose. We go up to him and say, man, you killed tonight. You, you, you killed tonight. Only for him to say, to God be the glory and we laughed about it but the truth of the matter is the next Sunday I could come back and flop the next time I can open my mouth and hit every wrong note but every time I do what God called me to do it's to God be the glory in the midst of all my sin and I still can function to God be the glory he should have taken me out but to God be the glory it is of the Lord's mercies that he did not consume you in the hotel room it's of the Lord's mercies that he didn't take you out Lord have mercy in your sin so to God be all right. Woo. I can't even, I don't even think I can hoop no more. I ain't hooping in such a long time. Shake your neighbor's hand and say, to God be the glory. So, so I'm getting ready to close. Don't do that, Caleb. I'm getting ready to close. 
verse 24. Verse 24 says, after Saul, after Saul has a conversation with Samuel and Samuel reveals what God's real intentions were for his assignment and why God actually gifted him. The Bible says in verse 24, and I'm closing here. Uh, the Bible says, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. Uh, you see, the problem I'm going to have today with a lot of you uh, is that you're going to walk out of here uh, and not repent. Yes. Come on. Come on, sir. You're going to walk out of here uh, and operate in the same way you've been operating. Uh, you're not going to change your mind uh, because why? You got too much pride. Too much arrogance huh, that's bottled up on the inside of you. Huh, and God can't use you on another level. Huh. Uh, can I tell you something? Huh, when you find yourself disconnecting, this is what God showed me. Huh, people will find themselves disconnecting from different auxiliaries in the church. Huh. Can I tell you something? Let me help you, Mount Moriah. Huh. Stop blaming yourself. Huh. People will find themselves disconnecting from the ministry. Huh. You were with us. Huh, but in the pandemic, like I said in March. You're going to end up leaving before we return. Uh, why? Because uh, you got lifted up in self. Uh, there's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. Uh, there's a problem. The reason uh, so many people feel themselves detaching away uh, is because God knows uh, that the level that he's about to take the ministry to, uh, prideful people won't survive. And so he goes ahead and disconnects those. Y'all heard me teach y'all about smelting. That while you're going through transitions as this church has been through this year. While you're going through the fire. While God is refining you. God will smelt you. In other words, he will snatch out things and people that will hinder the progress of the ministry on the next level. So before you sit down and say I quit, you better ask yourself, is God smelting me? Am I not even qualified to work in the level of ministry that God is calling the church to? Because as I can guarantee you, it's not everybody else's fault. It's not that you can't get along with other people on the ministry. It's not that we can't build no chemistry. It's that you have not made the commitment to release your arrogance and humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. I need you to tell somebody near you, say, neighbor, humble yourself. God wants to call us to another level as a church, but he needs you to humble yourself. In verse 24, Saul, he made up his mind that I'm going to overcome my life and that I keep telling myself, I keep telling myself that I'm only going to do ministry when it's convenient. I keep telling myself that pastor just throwing shade I keep telling myself they trying to control me they trying to be all in my business they trying to take up my life and my calendar and Paul Saul says I'm going to release that from my mind I'm going to rebuke pride and I'm going to repent Lord have mercy would you grab somebody's hand and say neighbor it's time for you to repent put down all of that pride and repent let this mind be in you I didn't feel like it when I got up but I feel like having a little bit of church I said let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus if Jesus Christ can rebuke his own pride if Jesus Jesus Christ can do away with his reputation if Jesus Christ can do away with how he sees himself then you with your flawed self ought to be able to reduce your pride and say wherever you need me to serve I'll serve if you need me to see I'll sing if you need me to play I'll play Lord have mercy thank you Donald for the example because there was another week a couple of weeks ago when y'all made up your mind that you just wanted to have to praise and worship and only two of y'all were here that Donald jumped 
out of the media booth and say wherever you need me to serve I will serve give me a mic and let me see yeah yeah I, I, I feel like preaching grab somebody and say neighbor 2021 belongs to Mount Moriah and I made up my mind I will not be a hindrance to the next level when pastor says we got to go I'm ready to go when pastor says we got to pay I'm ready to pay I didn't spend all my money on my hair I didn't spend all my money on my nails I didn't spend all my money on my car but I made up my mind I'm gonna set aside something for the Lord is there anybody in the house tonight that can say no I'm an impactor for real and I'm ready to push the church higher I'm ready to push the church to the next level I know that the devil has been fighting you tooth and nail trying to make you give up trying to make you throw in the towel trying to make you leave the church it's the devil that try to make you throw in the towel it was the devil come on Dion that was trying to make you turn your back on God it was the devil that tried to contaminate your perception of your leader in your eyes but God sent me here to tell you to tell the devil no weapon no weapon that's formed against me shall prosper I know that you wrestle tooth and nail because the devil wanted you to give up and it caused you to cry but it's all right one thing I know one thing I know you may have to cry if you're connected to Mount Moriah you may have to shed some tears if you're in this church but it's all right weep in me weep in me endure for a night but grab your neighbor's hand and say neighbor shall it shall it comes in the morning I feel like lifting them up I feel like praising God grab somebody by the hand and say neighbor my pastor at the beginning of the message let me know I was about to be replaced but I made up my mind I repent try me again Lord give me another chance I know you gave me a gift and I'm not gonna use it in the wrong manner if you believe it see it Getting ready to test Mount Moriah. I'm getting ready to test your maturity. I'm getting ready to test your growth. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise Him for my message of correction. Can you praise Him when your pastor has brought you into alignment? Can you praise Him when your pastor? Has hurt your feelings can you praise them when the pastor has exposed your room can you praise them in the sanctuary praise them in the firmament of his power yeah praise them for his mighty acts oh shucks let everything open your mouth if 
if you want to dance about anything, you want to dance that song. He made it to verse 24. God could have killed him before he repented. God could have took him out before he got it right. God could have took him out before he said, I'm sorry. But he gave him mercy. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great. to praise God in this house praise him you're still alive after your sin you grab the microphone after your sin you touch that instrument after your sin you still run around the church after your sin you still dance after your sin he still let your business flourish after your sin he still kept you alive so you ought to give God praise because his mercy endureth forever. Yeah! Yes! Repent. No music. Repent. Only those of you who can dismiss arrogance, dismiss pride, this is the place where you repent. Forgive me, God, for handling your church, your bride, your work out of convenience. I only show up when I feel like showing up. If there's a better opportunity somewhere else, I go there. Forgive me. For not being able to take correction. Forgive me for even thinking about leaving the church you called me to. Forgive me for being out of place. Forgive me for not serving where my gift calls me to. Forgive me. I blamed it on everybody else. I blamed it on everything else. Now it's time for me to point my finger at myself. Forgive me. In the name of Jesus, we repent. Dion, we repent. We are sorry. The Bible says, I need you to understand this, and, and this is why I wanted to make it a series. I don't, have, I don't have time to find it, but this is why I wanted to make a series. Because Saul said, I'm sorry. And God anointed David. In other words, stop acting like what social media says that we serve this punkish God that's just so loving that he won't take your anointing and put it on somebody else. Saul said, I'm sorry. And we're still replaced. Because for this next season, we need somebody in place who won't take their place for granted. If you operate, let me talk to the leaders. If you operate in a ministry in the church, if you operate in front line, you should feel bad if you have no fruit for the past seven months. That in this pandemic, there was no creativity on the inside of you that said, what can I do? I'm attached to a church full of creatives. Attached to a pastor who is a creative. And there was nothing I could do for my ministry during this pandemic. Before I do, you should sit yourself down. Because 
this is the time, this is the season where we cannot shift responsibility anywhere else. You have to face yourself. Stop blaming your disconnection from different auxiliaries on people in the auxiliary. If God called you to work there, work there till it gets better. Stop acting like you don't know you are connected to a church that people go to. People have different attitudes. People have different dispositions. And if you cannot get along with people, sit yourself down. Stop blaming them. Say, it's me. I'm the problem. I'm the reason. I want to be restored. But I know I can't operate right now. We get ready to pray. I want you to hear my heart today. I ask God to strategically develop this message. Because a lot of you, you know, sometimes it's funny. Because I do say sarcastic remarks. And I do... I can't be shady sometimes. But you have to be at the place where you can hear what I'm saying. Some of of the stuff I say to get your attention. But you need to be able to hear what I'm saying with priestly ears so that you can take it into your life, repent, and develop a better way. If in January I have to come back and re-preach the same thing, we're not growing as a church. We're not growing. This is the time, this is the place, this is the season for us to flourish. This is the season for us to grow. From the pulpit to the door, step up to the plate. Let's do more. I'm not on an auxiliary. I'm not in a ministry. Find somewhere to work. It's going to take all of our hands doing our part to make this work. If it just means that I'm have to find somebody to register with me for church. That's what I got to do. Truth of the matter is, you all need to hold each other accountable. Look around Mount Moriah. We're only letting 75 people in. We have 100 members and we have visitors. That means our people are not in place. We have work to do. And it cannot just come from me. We got to grow past that. I can't do this every Sunday. There's some Sundays I want to come in and preach directly to your situation. I want to come in and prophesy so you can run. I want to give you some of these amazing sermons that God has given me. But I have to come and correct the house. Because you're just not getting it yet. You're not hearing with priestly ears. Some of you, you walk out of here on Sunday. You don't think about Mount Moriah until next Sunday. How are we going to grow? One thing is for sure. I gave you all Bible tonight. From beginning to end. When I was minister of music, I was talking to my cousin Howard McNair. I said, how in the world do I get the choir members to act right? How do I get them to show up? How do I get them to be on time? How do I get them to do what they're supposed to do? He said, nobody can argue with Bible. So after this word you've heard today, if you do not fall in line, you're not disobedient to your leader, you didn't want to follow the word of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for loving us so much that you would send a word to challenge us. Thank you for loving us so much that you send a word to correct us. Because we know now, God, that correction means you want to give us another chance. If you allowed us to be here tonight to repent, it means you want to give us another opportunity. So, Father... Thank you for your word. We just want to say thank you. Thank you for your word. We rebuke tonight the spirit of offense. 
we rebuke that spirit that will cause someone to allow the enemy to get into their ear and make them leave the church because of correction. We rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus. Father, heal us from here. Push us to the next level. Help us to do what is right. Help us to fix our priorities. To put the kingdom of God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Help us to put you first. In the name of Jesus. Light a fire down on the inside. That not only will we understand the privilege of serving you. We will have a passion to serve you. Woo! In the name of Jesus. We want to serve you with a smile on our face. We want to serve you with a glad heart. We want to serve you loving what we're doing. We bless you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.